Thank you all so much for being here. Uh, as I think most, if not all of you know, I am Dr. Mark Schiffman, Chair of the Department of Humanities. And it's my honor and pleasure to welcome you to our annual Faith and Reason Lecture. This is uh, one of the two big lectures that we put on each year. Uh, in the fall, we have our Faith and Culture Lecture for which we uh, invite someone from outside uh, who is um, qualified to address some aspect of culture, whether it's literature or sculpture or painting or architecture, and, uh, and to discuss its relationship to, uh, to faith. <laughs> and then here in the spring semester, our Faith and Reason lecture, which from its inception uh, has always featured one of our own faculty to speak on the relationship between faith and reason in some dimension. And this is um, an integral um, principle of the humanities department uh, and our curriculum and our teaching, which seeks to address the fundamental questions of human life uh, with rational inquiry uh, and, um, and to explore how that rational inquiry can be illuminated and augmented by the resources of the tradition of faith. And so our Faith and Reason lecture uh, addresses some dimension of what it is fundamentally to be a human being in this uh, journey of inquiry uh, this effort to understand the shape of our life and our world and our relationship to, uh, to others and to our creator, <clears throat> to do that in a way that, in whether explicitly or implicitly, uh, whether primarily or sort of as a background uh, matter, is illuminated by our own understanding of the tradition of the faith and the inquiry within the faith as exemplified by St. Augustine. It is our tradition to, uh, to have our Faith and Reason lecturer introduced by one of our own students. And uh, in order to do that this year, uh, <clears throat> we have our senior humanities major, Sean Rogers, from Colorado who has uh, studied a fair bit with Dr. Smith. And uh, I'll hand it over to Sean to introduce Dr. Smith. Good evening, everyone. And um, now, welcome to the Faith and Reason Lecture. I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Thomas Smith who um, has been, I would consider, you know, I've studied closely under him over the last three years, and it's a great different pleasure to introduce him. And uh, his talk, Deferring, Deferring the Good. While preparing these kind of brief, well, preparing these like brief remarks, what I basically thought about is, well, what's the point of brief remarks? What's, what are we trying to do? <laughs> Forward, right? And I thought, well, thinking back in all the lectures that I've been to, the best, um, the best remarks, at least, you know, thinking, was not really about. It was to, to leave the audience with kind of a sense of awe or, or like impressed, you know, like, wow, look at all the amazing things that the speaker has done. And then in the worst case, a few times I've thought, I think basically that was an effort to make the speaker feel good before they took the floor. <laughs> <laughs> so. In reality, I don't think the introductory remarks are about that at all, and these definitely aren't about that. These, um, what I'm going to say about Dr. Smith is, um, it's a litmus test. It is um, basically um, things which I think will tell us that for the next 45 minutes, we should, as an audience, either sleep or listen. <laughs> and so with that in mind, I, uh, I present what I consider, after reviewing all of his accomplishments, is an abridged case for, for listening to Dr. Smith. So, um, 
Dr. Smith begins his academic journey basically at Georgetown University, where he begins to cultivate an interest in political philosophy. He then continues on, something that I didn't know, he did his master's from the Catholic University of America, and continues to think about political philosophy, especially kind of with a peaked interest in Aristotle and Plato. In 1993, he earns his doctorate from the University of, of Notre Dame, kind of the crowning uh, experience which which sets him up for his next step, which I thought was kind of unique. In 1993, Dr. Smith comes to Villanova University where he is until today, so that's over 25 years of teaching experience at one academic institution, which um, I think it speaks to to how Dr. Smith understands his role in, in committing to, to specific community. He begins his experience at Villanova University as a professor in the political science department where he spent 23 years teaching. Over that time, he earned the academic award, uh, more than the academic award, it was the Martin Manley Distinguished Teaching Award. And then in 2001, he was awarded Villanova's Lindback Award for Teaching Excellence. Two of the, the most recognized accolades that you can receive here at Villanova University. I think what those things speak about, again, is his ability to, to connect with, with students and to, and to kind of take them on an academic journey, which is significant. Now, many of us in this room can be thankful for what was arguably Dr. Smith's most indelible contribution here at Villanova. In 2003, he was appointed the first chair of the Department of Humanities. During his five-year term, he crafted, shaped, and gave the original character to the course of study, which we know today. And over the last eight years, he's occupied the Anne Quinn Welsh Endowed Chair and been the director of the Honors Program. Now, outside Villanova University in 2018, Dr. Smith's service was recognized by Pope Francis, who awarded him with the Cross Pro Ecclesia et Pontifice. This award is given for exceptional service for the church in some form of outstanding Christian witness that is carried out in a generous and sustained way. So, if recognition by the Pope like isn't enough, <laughs> uh, I'd like to finish with a little quote followed by a personal addendum, and then open up the, open up the stage. So, this is from Dr. Smith's book, Reevaluating Ethics, which, according to Dr. Schiffman, is the best common commentary on Aristotle's ethics in English. That's impressive. <laughs> so the quote, the quote I think is interesting. This, this, is, this might come as a surprise. And this is the beginning. This is from the preface. When I was 16, I stole a copy of the Nicomachean Ethics from my brother Ed, skipped work, and on a Long Island beach read Aristotle's account of friendship. But not what I'm doing on the beach. <laughs> I was hooked and still am. It's fitting that my introduction to Aristotle was through acts of injustice because a large theme of my work is that we often come to virtue through vice. So I wanted to use this quote because it shows that Dr. Thomas Smith, um, he doesn't just think interesting things. He doesn't just have powerful ideas which, which are appealing and again, kind of just inspire a sense of awe that comes and goes. After studying with him closely with him for over three years, I have seen personally that he's as he says, hooked. He's hooked on listening to the human experience and seeing it all the way through, hearing it out. He's hooked on helping people ask essential questions and encouraging integral growth. He's hooked on bridging the gap between the beautiful truths gleaned in the classroom and the action of every day. He respectfully guides his students to recognize and embrace the most flavorful aspects of life. Who doesn't want that? <laughs> so, without further ado, or to not be further good. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Sean, for that. That is that was just terrific. I will remember that forever. Um, uh, thank you. Um, thanks to Dr. Grubiak and Dr. Mrs. Tomko, who did a lot of behind the scenes work advertising, come up with a great poster. Uh, thanks to Dr. Shipman, my chair, who's been such a big support for this. Um, 
thanks to my students, my current and former students for coming. You guys have seen me teach and you, you came anyway. <laughs> <laughs> this is uh, a great uh, event. Um, uh, looking back, uh, I am just so proud to be part of the humanities department. Uh, this lecture series has been going strong, I think, for 10 years. Uh, 11 years? 10 years? 11. 11. 11. Um, and the, the best lectures I think I've been to at Villanova have been part of the series, so I'm going to try to live up to the, to the bar that my colleagues have set. Um, the point of the lecture series, as Dr. Shipman said, is to sort of pose questions that undergraduates are asking and to work through them with the, the, the lens of philosophy and theology and see what that can illuminate. Um, so if you're not a humanities major, this will give you a sense of kind of what the department does. Um, this evening, I would like to ponder two questions. And these are questions that I think my students ask all the time that they come <coughs> in my class. Sort of really flat-footed questions, very good questions. Um, what's wrong with our politics? Something is wrong. <laughs> it's not that they're right, uh, but something is going on that's not right. Nobody, nobody says, well, on the bright side. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and then this other kind of amorphous, flat-footed question, which I think is really important, uh, how come we can't get along? Right? If you're, if you're uh, in marriage therapy or therapy, you have to reach that point where you're like, what's going on? How come we're fighting all the time? Um, and then maybe you can start, once you admit that, you can start to move through it. Um, so tonight I'd like to sort of wrestle with these questions, and I'd like to wrestle with them in kind of three steps. Um, I'd like to get a better sense of what's happening. So when we, when we kind of think about these questions over a beer or something, we'll say, um, oh, it's Trump, or it's populism, or it's uh, identity politics, or it's the crazy Democrats, or it's the crazy Republicans, or we have kind of shorthands for talking about what, what's happening, but they're not really getting at anything. Um, so I kind of, I'd like to take a little bit of time to kind of explore this question, what is happening? It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a puzzler. And then I'd like to talk a little bit about how come it's happening. Um, sort of a, a set of causes that, 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 um, that I think we might be able to identify. And then since that's, that's, a lot of that is bad news, um, I want to talk in some hopeful way about what we can do about it. And hopefully my, my recommendations or suggestions will be uh, helpful. Just to, that's, a, that's a big task. So, um, and I want to say I want to say that it has something to do with with this move that Hobbes makes. I chose this quote because all of you read Hobbes and ACS. All of you have seen it. This is probably the second most famous quote in Hobbes from a ACS, apart from the solitary poor nasty British short quote. Um, he basically says there's no such thing as the utmost aim or greatest good, as is spoken of in the books of the old moral philosophers Plato and Aristotle and so on. Happiness or felicity is a continual progress of desire from one object to another. The cause of this is the object of man's desire is not to enjoy once only, and for an instance of time, but to assure forever the way of his future desire. And so then in the first place I put for a general inclination of all mankind a perpetual and restless desire of power after power that stops only in death. This has been called the joyless pursuit of joy. <laughs> um, this is sort of what I mean by, def by deferring good. The question of happiness is so difficult, so problematic, it's so elusive that we're constantly tempted to sort of put it off and instead create a situation where we can get enough power. And I think he, by power, he doesn't mean just political power. He means status, money, choices, opportunities, things that will able, enable us to get whatever it is we want when we want it. So you move from the impossibility of happiness to the necessity of power. That's, that's what I mean by very good. And I'm going to argue that has something at, at root here is something to do with what's happening in the country. So sort of keep that in mind. Um, <clears throat> so I, I'm, going to, I'm going to sort of give this really odd story about little Dr. Smith. Um, <laughs> So you got to bear with me, because this will give you a, a sense of where I stand in relation to this problem. Okay. When I showed up at Georgetown, um, I got this, this physical book 
It's like a little thin book they gave to all the incoming freshmen. And it had a picture of every incoming freshman and then a little blurb about them, where they came from, and what their interests were. Um, it was called Facebook. The Facebook. <laughs> right. Although everybody at Georgetown called it the Meat Book because it was the way you met people. Although, for the first two weeks, you just sort of looked at people and whether they were whether they were attractive. So there were two senses of that word. I'm glad Zuckerberg chose Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> so I submitted, as I as you're supposed to, a picture, and this is what my Facebook. <laughs> This is a picture I chose to see. <laughs> so, you know, I'm from the South for a long time. I went to this high school. You probably know Shaman. Any Shaman guys here? Shaman, yeah. There you go. Shaman, yeah. That's very interesting. Shaman. Um, and I put down this interest people in politics. There was a whole check mark when you filled out the form about they asked you what, what you want, what you're interested in music and canoeing and whatever. And I chose the least interesting thing <laughs> so that nobody would know who I was and I would not commit to anything specific. <laughs> kind of what you want from college. <laughs> what I really wanted was to marry Bert Shield. <laughs> the, total, the total truth. <laughs> Little Dr. Smith wanted to marry Bert Shield. Um, I don't know why. <laughs> um, I had this idea that I should be a senator and be married for a um, I wasn't in love with Brooke Shields. How do you know? Because I've never met her. <laughs> I've been married 30 years, and the one thing I, one of the things I've learned about, about love, being married 30 years, is um, you can't love somebody you don't know. <laughs> and the other thing I, I learned is, you can't know somebody you don't love. Those are the two things I know about love, <laughs> right? Um, I had no idea who this person was, but I was in, I was in love with her, which is a kind of a common experience for a young person. And looking back, it's clear I, I love the idea of Brooke Shields, right? Um, she represented something for me bliss or happiness or joy or making it or getting out of the, the working class South Shore of Long Island and having a fabulous, fabulous, fabulous life. Um, she represented a longing for something I didn't know. I, I wanted something I did not know what, but it was something big and awesome, spectacular, romantic, right? Which is kind of what your longings are about. You have this great longing, but you're not exactly sure what it's about. So you kind of put it someplace, typically, especially when you're young. So I, I sort of glommed all these sort of longings onto this very attractive young woman, right? Um, but really, looking at these pictures, little Dr. Smith had no chance. <laughs> None. Right? Um, so maybe if I was a senator, this is as close as I could get to a senator picture. <laughs> maybe if I was a senator by the time I was 40 or so, I could reach not just, not Brooke Shields, but something. Whatever she represented, this sort of power and status, this um, power and Hobbes' sense, would allow me to get what I wanted, whatever that was. Um, <clears throat> so it's important to see through 18-year-old me. Right, um, my desire to be associated with Brooke Shields and my desire to be a senator was not about loving Brooke Shields. Right, it was it was some idea of her that I had that was standing in for this longing. Um, and my desire to be a senator wasn't about serving my country. Actually, um, it was about me, 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 me. Somehow, 
Isn't it interesting that I could move so quickly, so easily, from ignorance about what I wanted to arrogance that I should, I should run the country because <laughs> I don't know what I want? Um, that's kind of typical of human beings. It's typical of me. My life plan wasn't about loving this particular woman, and it wasn't about helping my country. It was about a life that tried to get power to get happiness, whatever that was. Um, I had the makings of a nar narcissist, so Brooke dodged a bullet. <laughs> now here's a weird digression. I was, I, was I was coming up with this lecture, and I remembered when I was a sophomore, so I'm getting with the program, um, <laughs> uh, it's like I'm, I'm going to an audition for the breakfast club. <laughs> I'm reading, you notice, I'm re I think I'm reading the Marx Engels Reader. I was thinking of, of course, on Marx that semester, I was getting ready to be Dr. McCarriger's colleague. Um, in sophomore year, somehow I landed a date with Lori Laughlin. No, I wasn't. Yeah. Um, <laughs> 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 I to become Andrew on Full House and was yesterday arrested. <laughs> Why was she arrested? For committing fraud. She was arrested, if you really think about it. She was arrested for deferring the good. She's thinking about college not as an education that makes you a better person. She's thinking about it as a credential that allows you to get power, that allows you to live a life where you can do as you please. And she moved from this notion of education as a power to cheating, doing what needed to be done. If she, and, and, and actually, I had the date arranged, but she, she backed out at the last minute, so I actually didn't go on a date with Aunt Becky. <laughs> <laughs> but see what happens when you when you break a date with the little doctor's <laughs> <laughs> If she went on this date and married me, our kids would have gone to Villanova for free, and there she would have been. <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious, it's all true. <laughs> so something even weirder than that happened, actually, uh, in sophomore year, right around the time I was reading Marx. Uh, I read Plato's Republic with this uh, really crafty old Jesuit, uh, which is the best way to read Plato's Republic. <laughs> um, and this is a turning point in my life. Socrates has this conversation with a young man in the Republic at the beginning. Thrasymachus, some of you have probably read it. And Thrasymachus wants the kind of life that I wanted. He says to Socrates, what I want is power so that I can set myself up to get what I want when I want it. This is the ideal life. If you can just get political influence and wealth and status, ability to persuade, then uh, whatever it is you want, you get it, because you have this capacity, right? This, this kind of omnidirectional capacity to make yourself happy. That, that's kind of deferring the good. That's what I mean by deferring the good. <clears throat> so if I can become a senator, if I can get power and influence, <coughs> the world's my oyster. I can marry Brooke, <laughs> whatever, whatever that represents. I can become happy at any moment in time. I can move from desire to desire and success to success. That sort of Hobbes' pitch. But Socrates' response to this young man really brought me up short. Look, he said, you're attracted to a life of power because it promises to allow you to get what you want whenever you want it. But what do you want in the first place? People want all sorts of things. And many of the things they want make them deeply unhappy. So power doesn't solve the problem of happiness. It might actually complicate it, insofar as you set yourself up to get something that's bad for you. In reality, he says to this young man, you're attracted to power because you don't know what you want. You don't know what's good for you. You don't know what makes you happy. And so you move from this ignorance about happiness, like Hobbes does, to the necessity of power. <clears throat> and your life becomes a restless pursuit of power after power that ends only in death. To resolve the mystery of your life, you need to become a seeker. 
a seeker after your own good, therefore a seeker after yourself. That's the way to solve the problem of your ignorance, or at least address it. So I went to the academic life to become a seeker and share what I found with my students. And at the time, I met the person I think is, was the prettiest girl at Georgetown. That's my wife, my, you know, a long time ago. But um, we got married, we, got, we started having babies right away. If, if you can find the love of your life, I highly recommend that. <laughs> um, and then um, I sort of committed myself to certain goods, uh, being a good father, being a good husband, and loving my students. And that's kind of, that's kind of what I do. Um, and I don't hold up myself up as, as an example. I don't mean to kind of, this is just happy Dr. Smith. <laughs> that's all. And, and if, because uh, I have a lot of problems. But, um, a lot of faults. But uh, whatever happiness has come my way, um, has come because I've, I've loved good things and good people and a good place. I didn't kick the can down the road by saying, my task here is to sort of acquire power to get what I want when I want it. Um, what I tried to do was sort of love what I loved. Um, and then kind of happiness came uh, to the extent that it came. <clears throat> So, sort of, this is where I stand in relation to that question. I think it's a. I think the the, the move that Hobbes encourages you to make, to move from your the question of what makes me happy, to this question of seeking power, influence, status, wealth, is a disastrous move. I think it's a fake. I think it's a lie and a cheat. It's kind of what Voldemort says to Harry Potter: "There is no good and evil, Harry. There's only power, and those too weak to achieve it." Voldemort says that. He's the bad guy. <laughs> um, so, so keep keep that kind of in the background in mind. This is my way of kind of setting the table in this weird way um, to to start to get you to think differently about uh, sort of casual assumptions we have about a successful life, because I think they're they're kind of at the heart of some of what's going on in our country. <clears throat> so, put it you know not putting that aside, but keeping in mind and moving forward, these two questions. Um, what's wrong with our politics? And uh, why can't we get along? And let's put aside the usual suspects, right? Trump or identity politics are all things that I, I kind of mentioned. I'm not saying these aren't problems, but let's just put them aside for a second, because we talk round and round about these, and we don't get anywhere. <clears throat> and let's try to figure out what's happening first before we figure out causes because it's hard to see what's happening. And here's, here's, here's the way I see it in a nutshell. Uh, politics is not happening where it's supposed to, and politics is happening everywhere else where it's not <laughs> supposed to. This is, this is kind of what's wrong, it seems to me. We have political problems, very clear political problems. And they're not, they're not market problems. They're not necessarily moral problems. They're political problems. And they're not being resolved by our political institutions. So where politics is supposed to happen, it's, it's not happening. Something else is happening. And then politics is happening where it's not supposed to happen. We, we inject politics into what we eat and what we wear, and how, how we wear our hair, and what we, you know, all sorts of personal things. And, and this is something like what we mean by identity politics, I think that politics has become kind of all in intrusive, all inclusive. It sort of infected our culture and our personal life, these considerations of power. And we're not exactly sure what to do about it. Like, look, I just, I just like this or that singer. Like, <laughs> I mean, that was, that was the old way of, of, of talking about them, that stuff. But all of a sudden, there's all this other, this layer of power politics rhetoric around those things. <coughs> So let me, let me sort of take each one in turn. Politics is not happening where it's supposed to. We have these, these very, I think, clear, serious, possibly solvable political problems. I'll just mention three. There, this isn't an exhaustive list, but there are three that came to mind. There's a rising tide of inequality of wealth and opportunity in the country. This inequality is tearing at the fabric of our country. The, the very wealthy are getting very much wealthier. 
and the people at the bottom are getting worse off. And the people in the middle are kind of stagnating. It's basically the story. Who's owed what in these respects? This is a political question. And there's, are there things that we can do to ameliorate this inequality to move forward in, in comedy? We can't resolve our, dis our disputes over immigrations and borders. This is one of the fundamental questions that a political society has to ask. Who's a citizen and who's not? What are the duties and responsibilities and burdens of citizenship? Where does a territory begin and end? And what to do with um, the, the, the sort of questions and problems around those borders, those sort of liminal spaces. Reasonable people can surely disagree about these things, but we're not being reasonable about our disagreements, right? Um, and it's one of the most basic questions a country can resolve, and it's a political question. It has these moral dimensions, but it's a political question in the sense that it has to be resolved by politics. Um, who's owed what form of recognition? Uh, that's another political question. We can't resolve the question of diversity and its relationship to a common nation. That's a pressing political question. It's this question that every serious society has to face. We're not, we're not discussing it or facing it in ways that are productive. So we have these political challenges. What did the House of Representatives do last week? I mean, this is, maybe this isn't fair, but they, they passed a resolution condemning hate. <laughs> like, and I'm against hate, <laughs> for the record. Um, and I, I know there's sort of a backstory about this that's complicated, um, but, it, but it struck me as sort of a, a kind of a futile gesture, given uh, this is kind of, this is sort of what, this is what we don't like about Congress. Um, and this is why our, our approval rating for Congress is, hovers around 15 or 20 percent. One of the reasons that we increasingly don't have confidence in our ruling class. Now, there, there's sort of an objection to what I'm saying. I'm basically saying politics isn't happening. Um, but you could say, Dr. Smith, wait a minute, politics ha is happening all the time. Like, the, the, the diagnosis typically is there's too much politics. You, you turn on Fox and CNN. Sometimes I'll turn on Fox and CNN, and I'll toggle between them. It's amazing how different they are. Um, and they're talking about who's up and who's down, and you see name calling and fighting and Twitter wars and partisan rancor and blah, blah, blah. Um, <clears throat> but that's not politics. Uh, it, Plato gives this image of a ship of state. Now, I, I kind of want you to remember this image as we go through. And he says that, that he, he gives this image as a way of differentiating uh, what you could call politicking, which is kind of fighting over power, from politics, which is a community trying to give each other reasons and take common actions and tolerate each other and compromise and move forward together. So in, in a ship of state where it's functioning well, Everybody feels like they're shoulder to shoulder in a common endeavor. You know, this is kind of idealistic, but that's what he's that's what he's pointing to. And the goal is to see everybody safely to the port, right? And to support each other. And to do all the things that you need to do in order to make that happen. Look at the tides and the winds and the stars and navigate well and take care of the ship and on and on and on and on. Because you're in this common project. That's politics. It's an image for politics. But he says a lot of the times, many people think about this ship of state as an opportunity to fight over who gets to steer. And so you're always sort of jockeying for position to see who's going to be the big boss, tell everybody how to behave. That's not the task of the ship, right? That's a, that's a debasement of the task of the ship, <coughs> right? So what's happening <laughs> with partisan rancor and bitterness and contempt and Twitter wars and all the stuff that happens on Fox and CNN, that's politicking. It's not politics. So I, I kind of reiterate my claim that politics isn't happening where it's supposed to, or, if, or what, what's happening is kind of a debased form of politics or a politicking. At the same time, um, the personal is the political. Politics is not happening at the political level. It's happening all over the personal level, and it's happening in, a, in this debased way. In other words, the culture has been subordinated to politicking in the sense of kind of jockeying for power, right? In terms of the ship of state image, this kind of politics is not about how to work together and so on. 
It's about how to kind of humiliate each other and get other people in your power, right? Um, Peggy Noonan had this column on Friday, Saturday in the Wall Street Journal. She's sort of a, a, a right center, um, former speechwriter for Reagan, columnist for the op-ed columnist for the Wall Street Journal. And she says, I, you know, I'm worried because, uh, this is really uh, sad to say, I'm worried because I feel like what's happening in the culture resembles in a certain way what happened during the Cultural Revolution in Mao's China. The central, the central question in, in the Cultural Revolution was not whether you were on board necessarily the, the, the party doctrines. It was whether you were a friend or an enemy. That was Mao's question. That was the question he drove at the revolution. Are you a friend or an enemy? And if you're an enemy, watch out. We're going to get you. And she gives a couple examples of this, but one is this tweet that uh, a, a, a person tweet put out in the tweetosphere, whatever you call it, and she <laughs> said, you know, um, people my generation, I think it's a millennial, are, are kind of lonely. There's nothing to do on Friday night. We, we, we either sort of binge watch Netflix alone or we go out in the bar scene, and neither of those are really healthy. So what if, what if we opened up the public libraries and sort of had um, things to do there that were fun? Like, that would be good. And then everybody says, you jerk! How dare you suggest that? Don't you know that librarians are overtaxed? That just means you're part of the problem. She just got raked over the coals. And she was like, I'm sorry. I didn't know. But I was insulting you people. I, I gave offense. And, I mean, it's a sort of ritual, right? Um, I'm not saying that we live in Mao's China, but there is this sort of feeling that we have, I think you all sort of know it, that you're not sure exactly whether you want to say what's on your mind or disagree with people because you don't know what's coming your way. And in our case, the odd thing about this, I mean, when I was an undergrad, I learned in my politics classes that, that there's a difference between authoritarianism and totalitarianism. And the difference consisted in this that in a totalitarian society, politics usurps culture, usurps it completely. And that's the state that does that. Now, obviously, the state's not doing that, regardless of what some libertarians say. We're doing it to each other, which is odd, right? Odd. With the help of, of certain institutions, right? Twitter, <laughs> social media sometimes big corporations, sometimes even universities. And I'm glad to say that Villanova hasn't succumbed to that. Right? Um, but that's a problem. And we have a responsibility to try to understand what's happening if you're in a popular government. It's not just something that somebody else can solve. And the, 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 the problem with that responsibility is that nobody can explain what's happening. And, and the political class, <coughs> Um, it seems to me, in my private judgment, is failing miserably. Part of our political crisis is that the ruling class are, and the so-called leaders, thought leaders, left, right, aren't able to explain what is going on here, even though it's very serious, I think. So they just double down. They go back, going back to the ship of state image, they kind of fight over the wheel as if that's going <coughs> to solve anything, right? And, and, by, and by continuing to fight over the wheel amidst this crisis and not giving anybody a positive way forward, they, they create this sense, this palpable sense that the elites are just in it for themselves, right? Um, and populism happens, right? Um, Trump, Brexit, yellow vests, populism has a lot of causal factors, very complicated. But one of them is the manifest failure of our ruling class and the feeling of stuckness that we have. We're stuck. We can't go back. We can't go forward. And we hate where we are. It's a bad place to be. And I, was, I was wondering whether I should You guys look so somber. I'm sorry. <laughs> I was wondering whether I'm going to tell the story. But I'm going to tell it because, because it's, it's, uh, it shows my, my, my state. I'm just surveying this. 
when I go to the movies now, um, I like going to the movies. And I used to like previews, but I hate it now. The previews come on and they're, they're the same preview. If they're the same preview. Um, there's some monster coming from outer space or someplace. It's going gonna, it's gonna to kill everybody. And it starts to wreck symbols of our civilization, the White House in Independence Day, or the Eiffel Tower, or things that, that we build that are important, that represent us. They, they are obliterating it. And, and the solution to this threat, this nameless, faceless sort of threat, monster threat, is um, power. <laughs> You, you count on some semi-divine beings to smash the threat and, and the, the, the sort of the people are sort of victims of the fight. Buildings are falling on them. And the whole time, symbols of who we are are, are sort of wrecked. This is, this is a symbol of stuckness, it seems to me. We feel threatened, we can't move forward, we can't move back, we don't like where we are. So the only solution is to smash and engage in violence and power. It's a, it's a dark place for your subconscious to be, it seems to me. And movies are an expression of subconscious in certain ways. OK, I'm sorry <laughs> <laughs> for all this bad news. I, I am going to try to get to good news. Okay. Um, I'm going to argue really briefly, this is a complicated argument, but I'm going I'm to try to be brief. I'm going to argue that, that part of our problem is the narrow way we see democracy. And I'm going, to, I'm going to talk about what liberalism's founding myth. And I don't mean the left wing of the Democratic Party. Liberalism means the, the, the notion that society is best understood as a collection of autonomous individuals. That's, that's what liberalism is. So you can have kind of Milton Friedman is a liberal. Right? He's, he's on the right, but he's a liberal. So I'm not, I'm not sort of casting aspersions on the left by saying this is the founding myth of liberalism. And most of you should be kind of aware of this story, because it's in the air. Right? Now I'm going, to focus on, I'm going to focus on two parts of the story. Society is a compact among self-interested individuals. So you have this sort of consistent argument in contract theorists, Hobbes, Locke, Rousseau, Kant, Rawls, etc., that we are interdependent we need each other in order to, in order to um, have a decent, commodious society. But um, we're also self-interested. And so we want to maximize our self-interest. And so we don't necessarily have a reason to engage in cooperative in, uh, activities and trust. So how do you get out of that sort of situation? Well, people, self-interested individuals contract. They, they sign certain limited rights away. And in response, they get protection, and they get the ability to cooperate. Everybody knows that story, right? Um, and then the second part of it, which I want to spend a little more time on, is uh, one of the ways to keep the state limited is that it shouldn't take a stand on the good, because individuals have all sorts of different ideas of what the good life is. And so you don't want to have a situation where people fight. Understand about, about questions of the good. <coughs> and so the state shouldn't take a stand on those questions. As much as it possibly can, it should instead empower individuals. That, remember, is kind of Hobbes' language. You don't take a stand on the question of what happiness is. It's an impossible question to ask. Instead, you try to, uh, through policy and institutional structures and so on, uh, create um, situations of empowerment so that individuals can live as they please, right? So the state, the state in, in Alistair McIntyre's terms is in, in this model is kind of like the, the, the electricity provider. Right? Electricity is a utility or a power that an individual can use however he or she wants to. You can use electricity to turn bread into toast. You can use electricity to turn on a light. Or you can electrocute somebody with electricity. It's just up to you. And, no, and the power company's not telling you how to use it. The power company's just providing the electricity. 
So if, if you read, has anybody read John Rawls? John Rawls is a very sort of compelling account of this in, in his account of liberalism. Um, he, he calls these, these powers thin goods, goods that uh, are, can be put to a, a multitude of private uses. And everybody should want more of them, whatever else they want. Opportunities, uh, choices, wealth. Mother Teresa wants more of those so she can help dying poor people. Jeff Bezos wants more of those so he can build Amazon. The government is just sort of providing these, and then people can use it however they want. That's, um, that's sort of the, the political version of deferring a good, right? In some sense, this is this claim, call it a neoliberal claim, um, is tries to solve the political problem in principle in a certain way. The political problem arises from the fact that human beings are interdependent and rational. We need each other to grow, and develop, and cooperate, to reach our maturity, to have a good life together. You can't imagine a, a flourishing human life as, as, a, as a life alone. But we're also rational. We're not ruled by instinct. We have to live together. But nature doesn't provide a straightforward way to answer some of the questions we have to answer, like how do you raise kids? Or what do you eat? Or how do you, um, what, what, what should rules of behavior look like? What's criminal law? What's tax law? The answer to those questions are not straightforward or obvious. And so you kind of have to get together and give people's perspectives and arguments and, and wonder, walk through those questions and compromise them tolerate differences and so on. That's kind of what politics is. <clears throat> but in this myth, politics is not about figuring out these discrete human questions politically. It's kind of about avoiding the question and <laughs> pushing it back down to the level of the individual. And I think certain things happen when you do that. I mean, it's an understandable move. You, you don't want to have sort of religious wars. But certain things happen when you conceive of democracy solely in terms of empowering individual choice, OK? And I want to I want to talk about the consequences of this really quickly. This is an argument from Tocqueville. It's a classic argument. I've been reading Tocqueville with my students this semester. I think they found it compelling. Um, you get a combination of atomistic individualism at the bottom and paternalistic statism at the top. So in this myth, this liberal story, uh, we are self-interested individuals. We contract uh, in order to cooperate in society. And we want to do that in ways that don't interfere with our dignity. So what that looks like is we, we disentangle ourselves from any dependence. We depend on tradition, so we throw out the past and act as individuals that aren't, um, that aren't bettered by the past. We don't want entanglements with big extended families because they tell you how to live and what to do. We don't necessarily want entanglements with religion because religion tells you what to do. Right? We want to kind of withdraw into a small private life. Um, Tocqueville describes individualism as sort of a, a nice placid feeling where the only people in your world are your immediate family and your close friends. It's not selfishness. You can do a lot of things for those people, but your social sphere has shrunk so that you can stand in, you, you have a feeling that you can stand at your own feet and you're the equal to any other person. So this, this way of thinking about democracy turns citizens into individuals. As citizens exit the public sphere in these tightly focused communities, in these shrunk social spheres, the state has to kind of rush in to fill the gap that happens as citizens retreat from public life. So it's not, it's not negative, necessarily, <laughs> in, the, in the sense that, that the work of government has to get done, but it's not being done by uh, citizens participating in the self-direction of the community. It's done by kind of the administrative state that does all sorts of helpful things, regulate nuclear weapons and inspect your food and tell you to just put on your seat belts and so on and so on and so on. Right? But, that's, but for Tocqueville, that's not self-government. Um, and that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a problem. Representative institutions have an interest in deferring the good in this, in this view of democracy. 
because they want to avoid taking stands on the good because they're controversial. And so what you get is sort of a consequence of difficult political decisions being made by the judiciary. <clears throat> the judiciary rules on, on difficult so political questions like abortion or marriage or free speech. Um, you sort of outsource those kind of political questions to the judiciary. And then Congress is in the habit of sort of outsourcing other kinds of issues to the administrative state. Right. Trump, Trump has declared an emergency, and, he, and the Congress has sort of authorized the president to declare an emergency. Whether he's right or wrong about that, that's going to happen. So they kind of identify a, a problem or an area that they want to solve. And then, so you're trying to get, yeah. <laughs> um, and they kind of ferret out the administrative state. That, that might be fine given the circumstances, but it's not necessarily self government. And this tends to make individuals um, lonely, homogenous, and materialistic. It turns out that when you defer the good and push these, these powers down to the level of the individual, I think my argument is, the government is saying, we will give you wealth and opportunity, choices, and so on. And then you can enact your own vision of happiness. But the, the, the vision of happiness that's being enacted is actually the proliferation of wealth and freedom under state's choice, and so on. So, Desires tend to get homogenized. People tend to get separated out. Right? There's kind of a palpable loss of community. Um, and one of the many problems there is that people feel very vulnerable because they feel like there's no support system. Right? Um, and they might be tempted in reaction to a kind of tribalism, fleeing from the, the kind of loneliness and alienation of, of individualism into groups. And I, I think that's happening both on the left and the right. Um, <clears throat> so back to our question. Uh, What's wrong with our politics? It's not happening where it's supposed to. <clears throat> and the way we see politics leads to undemocratic responses to political problems, both at the level of the person, the citizen is being changed into an individual, and at the level of the, the state, representative institutions tend to outsource political problems. This makes public life undemocratic by turning citizens into individuals. Individuals feel lonely, isolated, more tempted to tribalism and identity politics. And the other thing that I think happens here is when you defer the good for power in the way we've talked about, this encourages individuals to think that interests and power are everything. And that debases politics, but it also debases our personal relationships. Okay. I was wondering whether I was going to say this, but I'm going to say this too. Here's a little test to gauge whether the person you're talking to is a person that you can actually talk to. Ask yourself some questions. Is the person tediously predictable in what they say? People are fascinating. You sit next to somebody, and they'll tell you all sorts of stories about their childhood, or their parents, or what they love. Or kids, whatever. I mean, they're fascinating. People possessed by an ideology are tedious. I always talk the same way about the same thing all the time. Utterly predictable, because they're possessed by an idea. They're not themselves anymore. That's one test. Another test is if you try to give reasons that you think are compelling, the best reasons that you can, get, you can think of, and they come back with, those reasons are just an expression of power and interest. That's a sign the conversation is not going to go anywhere. Because reason itself has been turned into an instrument of power here. 
And if, if reason is only an instrument of power, it's only expression of identity and, 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 intra, and, and uh, perspective, we cannot have a conversation in which we, we take each other seriously as others. We can't learn anything about each other. Politics becomes impossible. Certain kind of person, interpersonal relationships become impossible. And the real question is kind of Mao's question, who's the enemy and who's the friend? That's a bad place to be. But it's a good test, right? <clears throat> so, um, you guys look so sad. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I really, here's, here's where we're going to end. We're going to try to end on a hopeful note. What can we do about all this if I'm, if I'm right? This is what's happening. This is why it's happening. What can we do about it? If the problem is the narrow way we see democracy, then maybe we should try to see democracy differently in a, in a sort of a larger way. Now, look, I understand this is going to seem like a lame response. Shouldn't we change our policies or get a third party or do something practical? Yeah, you know, maybe. Um, but we also don't want to. We also don't want to sort of go for a technological solution. <laughs> that's kind of where we. Part of part of my my talk is that's that's where we're tempted, right? So seeing things differently is actually an important way of changing your behavior. This is why a lot of the cultural touchstones that we have available to us talk about seeing things differently. Plato's cave. The central metaphor there is that we are blinded and we need to correct our vision to see. Or in the Gospels, how often in the Gospels does Christ cure a blind person before he preaches? <laughs> All the time. Because the, the reception of the good news has something to do with changing the way you see. So I, I'll give you an example of, of the power of changing the way you see. Because it's really important to change the way you see. Okay. My wife gives off, she's a therapist, she gives off this, this weird vibe that she's there to help people. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a weird thing. So a couple years ago, we got on a plane to Miami. I'm like, I have three hours alone with my wife with no kids around. I sit down next to her, and a guy, a stranger, sits on the other, in the other seat. Five minutes later, she knows that he's an alcoholic going through a bad divorce. <laughs> and she gives him therapy for three hours on the plane. <laughs> this is kind of my life. <laughs> so a couple weeks ago, we were in the, in the, in the pharmacy picking up a prescription. And uh, the, pharmac the pharmacist hands us her our script. And she says, shine your name. She's a miserable, angry person. And so my reaction is, i got to get out of here as fast as I can. So I start to sign my name, and she says to my wife, I hate my name. <laughs> my wife says, why do you hate your name? She takes the bait. I hate my name because I hate my, my ex-husband, and I have his name, and I hate him. And every time I see my name, I hate it, because I hate him. So my wife says, oh, well, why don't you change your name? Because <laughs> you can do that. And she says, um, well, I have kids, and my kids have that name. And so uh, I love my kids. I wanted, the same, I, wanted, I wanted the same name as my kids. And at this point, I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> And she says, um, do you love your children? And the woman says, oh, they're, they're my world. And my wife says, whenever you think of your name, think that is my children's name. And the woman says, oh my god, you changed my life. What did she say? You changed my life. I see things in a totally different way. Wow. And, and we went off, and she was happy. <laughs> now, you know, I think she has some struggles. <laughs> I mean, this is not like, she's not going to turn on a dime. But, but my wife gave her a different way of seeing herself, her name, who she was. Right? Um, so I, I don't want you to think this is a lame 
thing. So um, most of you have probably read this. If you haven't read it, go home and read it. Uh, if you have homework from this lecture, it's to go home and read the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King's letter for Birmingham Jail, because it invites us to think about democracy differently in a wider lens, a broader, set, a broader horizon. Um, what does he do there? He dilates our sense of what democracy is about, right? Um, he, he uses the language of lots of our traditions. He uses the language of, of liberalism. He talks about rights. But in his telling, rights aren't simply a moral trump that we use against the community to do as we please. That's kind of the, the liberal founding myth. Rights are a way of recognizing the dignity of the people in front of us. And so rights can be expanded in this direction. Um, he uses uh, Republican terminology. Uh, again, I'm not talking about the Republican Party. I'm talking about small r Republican, this tradition of sort of popular rule. Um, he talks about the demands of self-government, the need to move out from individualism into solidarity. He talks about the way justice demands we care about our fellow citizens and that we have to sort of stand before the tribunal of each other to sort of um, to judge ourselves. He talks about the burden of freedom and the responsibility of self-government. He reminds us that democracy isn't just about empowering individual interests. It's about shouldering a common burden and walking side by side in solidarity or mutual support, especially in the direction of justice and the weak. And he doesn't talk about all this in exclusively materialistic terms in the way that uh, kind of bourgeois uh, uh, individualism tends to talk. Um, he doesn't talk about avoiding harms or the economic consequences of segregation uh, or the health problems associated with segregation. Kind of these are the these are the way we typically talk about these kind of problems. Um, he talks about the demands of the gospel. He talks about we should love each other. He talks about it in spiritual terms, right? And he's not, a, he's not afraid to kind of, uh, he doesn't scrub his language when he comes into the public realm, right? He calls, herself, he calls us out of ourselves in this way. And the, and the overarching argument is that democracy rests on, on a central, single claim that each person is worth an infinite amount. Each person has dignity. And the experiment of democracy is figuring out how to make that manifest among us. And that's our task, not just to live as we please, to make that manifest. That's kind of our responsibility as democratic citizens. You guys are going to steer ships when you get out. Uh, like it or not, Villanova is part of the elite. Um, you'll run companies, you'll run law firms, you'll, you'll head hospitals, and so on and so on and so on. Um, how are you going to run the ships that you are in charge of? Are you going to be jockeying for position, elbowing people out of the way, and trying to be the big boss and, so you can get what you want when you want it? Or are you going to invite people that you uh, help lead into participation in some common project that's worth pursuing that lifts up the community that you're a part of. Um, that, that brings me to my second recommendation. Think about politics differently in a, in a, in a broader way. Think about the good differently as well. And here's where I'm going to kind of get more philosophical, because that's kind of what the Humanities Department does. <laughs> you remember the, from the opening that Hobbes says there is no good or happiness is impossible. And the response to that is to grab power um, in the sense of kind of teeing yourself up to get what you want when you want it. And happiness is seen as sort of a continual pro progress of getting this and that and this and that and this and that, none of which is very satisfying. Um, it seems to me, again, I'm, I'm biased. I, I gave you my, my experience of this. Um, in my personal life, but it seems to me this is a self-enclosed life. It seems to me that it has a whole set of presuppositions about what's good for people behind it. <clears throat> and what's good for people is 
uh, this kind of consumptive view of your, your, your happiness. Happiness is going out there and sort of getting things when you want them, right? But not to put too fine a point on it. It's a self-enclosed life. And I want to propose to you, oh, and it's a competitive life. So my good is not your good. It, the good is vociferous. It, it divides. It divides us from each other. Because my good isn't your good. What I want to suggest is a different way of seeing the good is the good is ecstatic. In other words, this comes from a Greek word which means stand outside yourself. The good is what draws you out into the world. Right? Um, this is, this is my experience anyway. When, you, when you're carried away from your kind of everyday life by an encounter with a loved one or a friend or a, a, a set of skills that you want to develop, um, you are drawn further and further into a reality that reveals itself more and more to you. That's kind of what it means to get good at something interesting. If you think about it, right? Sort of constantly being called out of yourself and developing capacities that are adequate to the thing that you love, right? Um, and that is not a self-enclosed life. That's a life of self-gift. It's a life of love, if you want to talk about it that way, right? It's a life uh, where <laughs> maybe, actually, you discover yourself more. You discover who you really are more in being called out of yourself. Maybe that's the paradox here. Maybe part of the reason we can't get along is this self-enclosed life doesn't allow us to come to know ourselves and what we really want. But this kind of ecstatic openness to reality, to, to what's abundantly good out there, um, also allows us to know ourselves. So let me give you this really kind of crude example of the difference here. So let's say you've had some stomach pain and you go into your doctor's office and the doctor comes in and says, uh, sorry, Joe, but we're going to have to remove your pancreas. And you say, oh, why? Why do you have to remove my pancreas? And the doctor says, I need a new boat. <laughs> That's a bad doctor. <laughs> right? It's somebody who thinks about their skill as a way of make, getting, getting what they want. What you want is a doctor who says, well, you're sick, and I'm devoted to your health. I'm not devoted to myself here, although I'll get paid. I'm, I'm called out of myself. I mean, the doctor wouldn't say this, but that's what you want from a good doctor. I'm being called out of your, myself to, to help cure you, because I care about your health, and that's what I'm about. Um, so maybe the good isn't as private as we like to think. Maybe it's actually shareable, and maybe it's accessible publicly. When you work, when you love, when you engage in society, think about what good you want to serve. Think about how you're being called out of yourself. See the good differently, and in the process, become more deeply who you are. OK, let me, let me close on a provocative note, um, because we're going to have a Q&A online now. Um, maybe this will provoke some questions. Um, so uh, I'll give you a different image of a boat than the ship of state. Uh, and although I think it might be related to the ship of state, um, the Gospels give us a different image of a boat. Maybe it's a related image. Christ calming the waters of the sea. One evening, Jesus and his disciples were crossing the Sea of Galilee in a boat when a furious storm came up and the waves broke over the boat and it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern sleeping on a cushion. So the disciples woke him and said, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? And Christ woke up and he rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a dead calm. And he said to them, why are you afraid? The experience of our common life is like a storm-tossed sea. It seems to be all about conflict and chaos. And we all feel buffeted by it, right? The gospel suggests that part of our problem is that we're asleep to the fact that our own deepest good is present to us already. It's right there. 
We don't have to defer it. We just have to wake it up. And the fact that we can't see it is the reason we're experiencing life like a storm. The Gospels also suggest that when we wake up to the reality that Christ is already among us, when we wake up to the fact that our good is already present to each one of us together, when we wake up the divine among us, then our storm stops. Right after they crossed the Sea of Galilee in chapter 5, Christ cast out demons. And if you know Greek, you know that the word for demons means the ones who divide. So immediately when he stop, calms, uh, uh, calms the storm, he eliminates what divides. <clears throat> so when the storm stops, maybe we'll have enough courage to sail the ship that belongs to all of us together to our common home in peace and friendship. And then um, after the question period, uh, we will have a reception out in the lobby with uh, Taste to Treat and the opportunity to continue the conversation with Dr. Smith amongst ourselves and, um, and to enjoy being together as long as we can do that. I was going to ask you, I, I was starting to gear up to ask about um, why you think people are so angry. Dr. Alper, Simicus is angry, and a lot of people now are angry, and that seems to be a great part of the problem. And then you told a story uh, of you at the pharmacy in which someone was angry, and yet it was a hopeful story. And so I wonder just what, for one thing, just what your psychology would be of what you think the anger is, and is it a problem, or is it simply a problem? Yeah, well, that's a great question. I don't know. I mean, uh, anger. Um, anger is not necessarily a negative emotion. It can be afflictive. We can we can sort of return to anger over and over and over, and we can stew on it. In which case, it becomes destructive. But it seems to me Martin Luther King Jr. was angry about being in jail and kind of being betrayed by his white uh, fellow clergymen, and that anger aroused him to do something important. So it seems to me that anger can be positive, but it has to be kind of thought through. It has to be, in Plato's words, kind of yoked to reason. Um, and it strikes me that anger is often a response to feelings of being threatened. Um, I don't think that's particularly profound to say that anger and fear are very closely linked. Um, but I think that's that's part of what's going on. Uh, you know, in Peggy Noonan's column, she says uh, people who are lonely f are are afraid, and I think this is part of the the challenge of individualism. This kind of this separation that tends to happen in modern democracies, uh, this retreat into into a small social sphere. We tend to feel beset, um, and then and then we we don't know how to sort of move out into the world to to encounter others. And we, we, we have substitutes to do this. I mean, the, the, the social media technologies, it seems to me, are, are arising in, in, in response to that need. But they don't, they don't, they exacerbate the problem in certain ways. Um, so I guess, I guess I'd respond that, that a lot of the anger come, comes from this kind of fear, which also feeds into this, let me identify with something that I can, I can gain an identity from. And that has that could be positive, you know, but it, but it but it has a dark side too. Uh, <clears throat> when or actually, the first one, do you believe there has been a period in this country like when politics were like in the right place, and if so, when? Yeah, that's a great question too. Um, politics ain't beanbag, so <laughs> I think that's the old expression. Um, what would be politics working? Wow. Um, 
I mean, Lincoln, Lincoln does give this sort of interpretation of the founding where he says the fact of the, the importance of the founding tended to make people set aside sort of ego stuff. There's a lot of problems around the founding, the way they treated slavery and so on. But it was a pretty remarkable thing that happened there. And it was partisan bickering and that's, you know, Hamilton and yeah. Burr and blah, blah, blah. Um, um, maybe politics work in a funny way. I mean, it, it broke down in, in very important ways in the Civil War, but maybe Lincoln was sort of, a, maybe this, he was kind of a, a messenger about this, seeing things differently. Um, go home and read the second inaugural. That's another. So I'm not saying politics was working, but you did have a guy that was calling us to something else, which is a, which is a political moment. Um, yeah, one of the th <coughs> thing, one of the thoughts that your talk suggests to me, just thinking about this question too, is that um, <coughs> right. In one sense, you can say. Well, our electoral system is just inherently a problem, right? So, you know, I'm looking at where the world's going, and I'm seeing, okay, you've got China where you have, you know, a, a political class that thinks about three generations ahead. And you've got the United States where you have a political class that thinks maybe two years ahead, which really reduces to thinking about the next news cycle. And so, so in some sense, in the sort of world power game, you know, we seem to be kind of doomed to fail or to lose. Um, but one of the things that uh, that your analysis suggests is that, well, it might not be, it might not necessarily be the case that this election cycle system is inherently self-destructive. It might be the fact that we don't have citizens electing representatives. Mm -hmm. And so we don't, one of the reasons the politics isn't happening where it's supposed to be happening in, 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 the, uh, in the governing structures is that politics is not happening where it's supposed to be happening in us. Right? That is making people actually citizens so that they actually choose representatives who actually sure. are responsibly. Mm -hmm. That, does that sound right to you? I mean, to what extent would that, how far would that go, right? If you could actually do something like revive a sense of, you know, political life. Yeah, I, I yeah, maybe um, if, if, if I was asked to sort of recommend a couple of structural changes, I might recommend uh, an at, a couple at large members of Congress that were elected from the nation as a whole. Sort of, how do you, how institutionally, if I was an institutionalist, I would think better about this, but how institutionally would you recenter uh, our, our, our representative institutions back from the executive and the judiciary into Congress? Uh, make Congress more attuned to the common. So you have 15 at large members, they're in charge of <coughs> special committees, I don't know, ways and means and whatever, I don't know. But then maybe, so that would that would draw our institutions back into kind of a common movement, and maybe I would you know I hesitate to say this, but uh, asking people to do a year or two of service or the military, um, you know I, I think that would be met with a lot of <laughs> problems. <laughs> but you know war is war is something that happens when people feel this way. Um, and I don't like the prospect there. So maybe, maybe this, you know, I, I always think of this, this question, maybe this is, this is one way of answering your question. My, my grandmother was a terrible racist. I remember her using all sorts of language when she lived with us. It was, it was awful to hear. And my dad never, ever, not once in the, in the, in the 45 years I knew him, ever used language like that. Never treated any, any person of color with anything but respect. And I think, I always thought it had something to do with him being in the military, because he had to work shoulder to shoulder with people on a very important project, and it kind of called him to a different life and made him political in that way and, and a better person in certain ways. Maybe asking people to make those kind of sacrifices would make sense in the, in the context we have. 
But, I, but what I will say is I don't think conservatives are right that politics is downstream of culture. If you're gonna, if that's, not, that's, not, that's not the way to solve a problem, by, by revivifying families, for example. If there's a problem in politics, you need to solve it with better politics. Tom, the, remark, uh, the remarks I want to make, before I do, I want to just say that William James beat you to the punch in uh, The Moral Equivalent of War. is a great essay which uh, recommends precisely this kind of public service. Um, what, what I was going to say was I think there might be a way in which um, your remarks lead me to think that things are both worse and better than we think they are. And, and, and here's why. I, I want to go back to your example that you gave earlier about going to the movies and seeing all these horrible previews and seeing how all these films are about the destruction of these monuments and institutions and how we seem to want this authoritarian figure who's going to come in and clean things up. And I wanted to go back to the destruction of the monuments. I have this theory that what's going on there is wish fulfillment yeah. in an odd way. Too. Yeah. And I think that the reason uh, for that is that people really are getting a sense that our institutions really are fraudulent, that they've lied to us, right, that they've betrayed us, and that we're in some sense finally seeing the way things really are. And I can't help but think on the one hand that's a good thing. But then you bring in Martin Luther King, right, and part, I, I remember that part of the argument in that essay is that you have to, at some point, realize and even partially create a crisis mm -hmm. if institutions are really that corrupt and fraudulent. And to realize maybe, maybe they do need to be destroyed. Maybe they, do, they don't need to be fixed or ameliorated. I mean, in his case, it was segregation. You don't fix segregation. You get rid of it. Maybe that's what we need to think about now. I will never forget the experience of seeing Independence Day the first time in the theater. I love going to the theater. I think it's a common experience, one of the few we have. I think Steven Spielberg is right that Netflix is a bad thing, generally, even though I watch Netflix. <laughs> and the White House got blown up and everybody cheered. I was stunned. <laughs> and, you know, maybe it's just kind of the, the who I am. Like, I, I love my country and I don't want to see it blown up. So, yeah, I mean, you know, he is right that uh, you have to see, th I mean, I think one way of putting King's point is you have to see things in a different way. You have to see it as a crisis and, and move past it. But a lot of bad things happen in a crisis. And a lot of bad things happen when you, when you blow things up. So I don't, I don't think that's, I don't think that's, that's sort of a, that's not, that's not kind of my response. My response is, uh, I mean, it's more local. You kind of take care of what's in front of you. And, and, try to participate in communities of care that, that, that make things better. I mean, I, I guess I'm having, a, I guess, a different sort of a takeaway, which is that, yeah, you have to confront what's going on in Birmingham, and, and you have to, go have to, you have to you know, realize what's going on in the rest of the South. But you also have to realize that there have to be, I mean, he even uses the term creative extremist right at several points in that essay. So maybe the challenge is, I mean, in terms of what you're saying about the, the politics of love and introducing love into our political culture, that maybe that's what we need is creative extremists. Maybe, maybe. I mean, I, I, do, think, I do think my invitation to see things broader is, is a struggle. I mean, the, 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 there's, a, there's a rhetoric that justifies this deferring the good. I mean, the reason I chose deferring the good, it, it's not a... It's not kind of a felicitous way of thinking about it, but I really wanted to kind of s to stick this point in people that there's a rhetoric that justifies this sort of move to to thinking of a successful life in terms of these powers. And you're a benighted, uneducated fool, a luddite, and so I mean all the names that people call you. If you say actually I want to foster the, uh, sort of local goods. Um, there's a kind of radicalism in that. If, if neoliberalism is kind of the dominant way we think about a successful life among elites, right? It's not a, it's not a populist reaction. Let's overthrow the elites and smash them. But it's it's not kind of laying down. It's a I am going to see things differently, and I am going to resist seeing things the way you want me to re to see them. 
Oh, sure, yeah. Uh, so I guess I have a question about about this. So you're saying that uh, liberalism defers the good, it kind of kicks the can down the road in the sense that you know, the state doesn't take um, a particular stance on on good. So for example, if you were to think of American, the, the way that the American government treats religion, for example, we say, well, we're not, we don't have an official right. state religion or something right. like that, right? Um, now, I'm curious, would, in your view, would it be good for the state to take a positive stance on the good in, in some sort of way? And if so, would, would that sort of flow out of the solution that you're talking about yeah. when you're talking about seeing democracy yeah. differently? Yeah, that's the question, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> that's a great question. <laughs> yeah. um, I, I will answer the question in this way. Politics is about the common search for the good. That's what it is. Um, I, I mean, I think this is why Aristotle calls us political beings. Um, th this is another image of, to, to sort of illuminate where, where I think we are. Neoliberalism, or whatever you want to call it, really, I think, tries, like Icarus, to fly above politics, to sort of make politics into a technical thing that you can solve by uh, growing wealth and uh, engaging the non harm principle and so on. That, that, that elites really think they can kind of get around the, the, the problem of sort of hashing it out, and figuring out how we live together. And, and Icarus has fallen to the earth, but Icarus survived. We have these political problems that just don't go away, and we don't know how to do politics anymore. That, that, that I think, is a, an instructive image that illustrates kind of where we are. Icarus fallen, try to, try to fly above the, the limits of human life in the direction of um, no politics and, and fell to earth. Um, when, you, when you decide whether to go to war or not, that's a question of, of the good, really. What's worth defending? And, and at what point is it, is it, is it um, justifiable to, to take a life? Grave moral problem, but it's also a political problem. You have to solve that problem. You have to, you have to, you have to tackle it. We haven't declared war since World War II, but we keep going to war, right? Because we don't want to take a stand on that question. If, if Congress was forced to take a stand on the question, maybe we can go to war so much. Maybe. And, and maybe, maybe um, I, mean, I don't want to state religion. <laughs> I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say that you, you take a stand on, on the question of, of the good in that way. But you have to figure out who we want to, who, how we want to enact criminal law. That's a that's a question of the human good. Who who has done something? What action is so heinous that we have to take this person out of our community? That is a question of the human good. How do we educate our children? What signs should we put up downtown to make downtown beautiful? That's a question of the human good, and it's a political question. Should we teach evolution? That is a political question, actually. I mean, in other words, it's a question for school boards. And school boards have to kind of sift through this, the issue of whether uh, you know, creationism makes sense. I don't think it does, actually. You should teach evolution. But it's, but, it's a, but it's a political question. Abortion's a political question. Um, so the, the, the response to uh, deferring, deferring the good is to engage in these kind of discrete questions together Knowing that we're going to we're going to disagree, we're going to have different perspectives, but we still have to offer each other reasons, and sometimes we're going to be on the losing side, and we want to make sure that uh, when we are on the losing side, we haven't gotten used to rubbing the loser's nose in it and taking everything from them and humiliating them because we might lose someday, right? Um, and and we're going to tolerate people's the, the the fact that people see things differently. We're going to welcome it because it's, the, it's not the beginning of a conversation, seeing things differently. It's not the end of a conversation at the beginning. See what I mean? So I guess what I'm saying is the, the question of the good is an inevitably political question. Yeah? One last question. Sorry. Rita, me, and then I just wanted to comment on the way that you were talking about how when the extremism was brought up, you said that it is kind of radical to want to bring that love into the politics. And instead of dismantling the system aggressively, 
to try to find a way to help talk to others and finding yourself the way to do it in a radical way that people aren't used to, like thinking of the radical terminology as something that you're not used to seeing in a way. And I wanted to agree with you because the way that you do the extreme radicalism and the way you would push that, I feel like if you're trying to dismantle the foundation that we have forcefully, then you're producing the next foundation that you create through the same thing you're trying to get rid of, which is you're using the aggression to get rid of what you think is aggressive. So the different types of good that you see for people, like you may say, like you were talking about how there's different goods people would think, and that was one of the things you may think is is wrong, that a lot of people subjectively, they may have a good that they think is material, materialistic or doesn't help anybody but them as an individual. And I feel like sometimes when I think of that aggressive push to dismantle and get angry and use that furor and that anger to dismantle the foundation, then the next foundation you bring up is birthed from the aggression and the hatred that you were trying to get rid of. So I wanted to ask you if you think that the way to do that instead of the aggressive and angry way is to do it in a radical way of trying to have people find that good, then how do you even go about that? Like, how do you push, how do you have other people see that or feel that yourself if there's so many people and so many people are already so influenced and they're set in their worldview? Then how would you, instead of using force to get the new foundation and get rid of this one, then how do you go about it non-forcefully but in any effective way. Uh, you mean on the level of politics or on the personal level? Or? It, it kind of like you said, it goes together, right? Because the politics, you say, the way that politics are now stems from how people inside are uncomfortable. They want power. And the politics, the power creeps into it from the individual. So they seek more power in politics. And the people who are seeking that power are fundamentally seeking it for the wrong reason. So once they're in that place of power, they have it and they have a bad mindset. Yeah, I mean, I do think I do think there are policies that are that are better than others. I think there are institutional reforms that, that might that might make sense in our situation. I'm not I'm not kind of a political scientist in that kind of straight up way. So I can I can talk about my own ideas, but um, maybe you know I always make a rule once a semester to say to my students this. Um, Plato thinks there's a relationship between the city and the soul. You can't have a good city unless you have uh, well-formed souls in the city. This kind of goes to Mark's question, I think, around Mark's question. Um, a couple years ago, I read this article in the New York Times. It was a, it was a, a peace conference in Newark. And uh, they invited two Nobel laureates. One was the Dalai Lama, and one was a, uh, an activist who tried to eliminate mines, landmines. And so, um, the Dalai Lama got up and gave this kind of city soul, Plato speech. If you want peace in the world out there, you must have peace in here. You cannot act peacefully in society unless you have peace in your heart. You can't have a, a good society full of bad people. So if you want peace there, work at peace here. And the activist got up and said, you know, that's the kind of thing that really pisses me off. <laughs> because you got to get angry to get justice, right? And, you know, that, that's an interesting dialogue. <laughs> um, but I, I tend to agree with Plato and the Dalai Lama. You, your anger is not, even your anger, if, if, the, if the anger isn't simply a negative emotion, even your anger to be productive has to be channeled in a way that's thoughtful and, and, and working to the good. So how do you do that? Uh, it seems to me you need kind of political reform and you need reform here. Well, how do you then, if there are some people, some people, well, humans as a whole, I would say, generally are accepted to be flawed. And most people have problems. And if you have people that just can't change their mind. You can't always force people to be changed through sure. force or by you can show them all the love in the world and they'll still find a way to hate you. So in what way would you say to go about like 
if those are the people in power and things like that, they won't come to reason. If you can't do it through force and have I don't even know. I don't know why you love them anyway. I mean, I, I don't have any answer, except personally, except that. Uh, you invite them into a relationship over and over and over and over. Even, even though I think my test still holds, there are people who want to get you in their power, and they want to humiliate you, and rub your nose in it. And there's no talking to them. And they're out there doing bad things to you. What you, what, you, what you don't do, what I don't mean by love is, you don't participate in the lie. Because more and more we're tempted to participate in the lie. More and more we're tempted to say, you know what, I'm just not going to say anything. Or I'll just agree when I don't agree. Right? I mean, there's a reason why Jordan Peterson is getting 14 million hits on YouTube. Because, I, I mean, I, I think he's a Jungian, I, I, think, I think his relationship, my religion is sort of vexed. But I will say that his, his response to this is actually pretty powerful. Don't lie. Don't participate in the lie. Because that just makes you complicit and you're part of the problem. You're in a world of trouble if you do it the other way. Because it's bad. So I'm not asking you to do nothing risky. Well, please join me in thanking Dr. Smith. <laughs> we have some time, please. Send it in the lobby. That's all right. Are you going to I mean, where, where is
Tangential positions. Yeah. That's sort of the of the others out there. Make our fitness as good as it's all transparent. Laid all of it. And we put it. Right. So it's it's very very my first day, yes. And it's unavoidable that that would be. And there are virtues, there's a company, all that, but it's all part of the I mean, how do you figure out whether it'll quit? You know, um, zone, your, uh, zone your downtown. Questions. What's best here? Where do you put the hotel? And what's what that going to do? This guy's business. I, you know, those are good questions. I just don't think you can avoid them. They're not all sort of culture. Thick good questions. Whether we should have Christians as conservatives and Muslims from one of the states. I don't know what you know. Yeah, let's be I wanted them to get uh, some sense. I mean, James's question was apt. I should have. I should have. You know, trust busting. Did that work? I guess. If the Earth is on to the civil rights, I mean, the invocation of King was. There's a sense in which it works. Right. One answer to that was from what might have been. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe there was some kind of sociopolitics. Because if we're having this fundamental so, so there's like these acronyms to either the about I don't know about yeah. right. isn't that politics work? I just don't want this. Well, I mean, this is why this is why this image of Dicker is kind of sticks with me. We're all on the ground, we tried to build many politics and new new liberalism that didn't work, now we're kind of stuck with these political questions. Yeah. So that's that's, that's a tricky thing. I, anyway, my one thought was I mean, it's the perils of politics. Of politics. Yeah. Because, yeah. I mean, just the jewel of sense. Or, you know, I can now say it's very popular. Ah. Uh, doing well. Yeah. Did you have a break? I don't know. Was it? Yeah, I think it didn't work out. 